The Juno World Affairs Council, in cooperation with 360 North, presents Are Dictators Getting Smarter? The Battle Between Dictatorship and Democracy with Will Dobson. Dobson is Slade's politics and foreign affairs editor and the author of The Dictator's Learning Curve, Inside the Global Battle for Democracy. Uh, good evening. It's, uh, it's a pleasure to uh, be here tonight, to be in Juneau. This is my first uh, time in Alaska, and I jumped at the chance to have the opportunity to come uh, to Alaska to see it for myself, uh, finally, uh, and, uh, and be here tonight. It's a real honor. I want to especially thank the Juneau World Affairs Council uh, for making this possible, and in particular, Jim Clark, who, uh, who has been a wonderful host and uh, is really responsible for uh, making this making this possible. Um, I want to begin with what I think is a fairly almost incontrovertible truth, um, which is that these days it's not easy being a dictator. Now that isn't necessarily a call for empathy; it's just an observation. Um, but that not long ago, autocrats were able to use the bluntest weapons to keep a population, a people under their thumb. We think, and it's really not that long ago at all, we think back to examples like um, Stalin's gulags, uh, Mao's revolutionary campaigns, uh, Pol Pot's killing fields. These are some of the most extreme examples of the 20th century. Um, and what's changed is that today, dictators have more forces arrayed against them than ever before. I mean, if one was to sort of tick off a list of what some of those elements or forces are, at the top, you might say, was the collapse of the Soviet Union. With the collapse of the Soviet Union, dictatorships around the world lost uh, an economic lifeline. Um, they lost their main support. And in the wake of the Soviet Union's collapse, we saw a tremendous growth in the democracy promotion business, if you will. Uh, a real cottage industry overnight where in a matter of only a few years and all the way through the 1990s, you saw the growth of organizations, NGOs, uh, and other civil society groups that have the expertise and the resources to send activists, experts, uh, and staff to the far-flung corners of the world to shine a spotlight on a regime's worst deeds. Maybe if the most obvious change in this period of time has been the revolution in technology itself. Uh, about eight months before the Egyptian revolution, I was in Egypt uh, meeting with members of uh, Mubarak's inner circle. And I was spending time with one political advisor to Hosni Mubarak who, when I asked him if it had gotten more difficult, he said, oh, absolutely. Are you kidding? We didn't have to deal with smartphones before. We didn't have to deal with satellite news, I mean, news that we can't control. These are all forces that we're dealing with, and they're forces that, that Mubarak understands, apparently not well enough. It, these, it was an incredible time, and it's something I talk about at great length in my book, because spending those, those weeks in, in Egypt, um, about eight months before the collapse, it's, it's like a time capsule of spending time with a group of people who have no idea that they're on the precipice. Uh, and indeed they were. Um, you can think of an event like one that we all know well, like the um, massacre in Tiananmen Square 25 years ago. Uh, the, when the Chinese Communist Party declared martial law, what was their next act? Their next act was to pull the plug on CNN. And I don't mean that in a figurative sense. I mean, quite literally, they pulled the plug on the broadcast and it went dark. They needed to do that before they moved on the square. It's something they're very mindful and something that would be completely impossible to recreate today. We have so few images of what happened on June 4th, 1989. But right now in Hong Kong, Beijing knows that if they were to move violently against people in the street, it would be captured by 10,000 smartphones and broadcast around the world in real time. You don't even need media to be present, although, of course, Hong Kong is very large media city. A, a good example of this was from several years ago where there was an instance where there were Tibetans who were fleeing China and they were fleeing China over H Himalayan mountain pass at 19,000 feet. 
on, 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 they were going over one peak, and on another peak, there were members of the People's Liberation Army, soldiers. And they saw the Tibetans lined up. They were walking single file over this ridge, men, women, and children. And the soldiers lined their, went their, their weapons up and began to knock, knock the Tibetans down one by one with their, with their rifles. What they didn't know was that on another peak, there were Bulgarian mountain climbers who captured the entire thing on video and came down off the mountain. And immediately, within about 48 hours, it was being broadcast all around the world. The point being that even at 19,000 feet in a Himalayan mountain pass, you can't get away with some of your worst crimes. And then maybe if there's most, the most obvious example or evidence of the fact that it's gotten harder uh, to be a dictator, it's the sheer empirical uh, number of them. In 1972, there were 41 democracies in the world. By 1991, that number had risen to 76. By 2005, it was more than 120, which 2005 represents the high watermark for political freedom in the world. But then something changed. And what, that, what, what changed was that the world's most unsavory regimes made a comeback. Political freedom around the world declined, has declined every year since 2005. Uh, it's the longest continuous decline in, in more than 40 years. Uh, the number of democracies in the world today is at its lowest figure in the last 25 years. And some of our chief success stories, um, Ukraine, Thailand, and now even Hungary, have begun to unravel. Now, it's part of my premise and part of what I explore in my book that I, I don't believe that the problem rests with democracy. Democracy, as battered as it may be, is not at root the problem. If we learned anything in 2011, in amidst a global economic recession, we learned from the events of the Arab Spring that people all around the world are still willing to take enormous risks in order to be free. So the appeal of political freedom itself is not, it's, it's not really at root the problem. It doesn't explain this dramatic decline in political freedom around the world. People still desire it. What changed is the nature of dictatorship. Today's dictators are more sophisticated, savvy, and nimble than we often give them credit for being. Face, facing these pressures, many of which I just, I, I just itemized, the smartest didn't harden their regimes into police states, and they didn't close themselves off from the world. Rather, they learned and they adapted. Modern dictators have honed new techniques, methods, and formulas for preserving power, in effect, refashioning dictatorship for the modern age. So what do I mean by new methods or formulas? Well, all of them are born from one central insight, which is that in a globalized world, the most effective forms of coercion are subtle. These are the forms of coercion that you can that you can perpetrate at the lowest possible cost to yourself. So, for example, in Russia today, if there is a dissident group that the Kremlin would like to see shuttered, it is not likely that the leaders of that organization will somehow disappear in the night or that they'll simply be abducted and never seen again. That's not that likely. What is likely is that one day in the afternoon, they'll be visited by a tax inspector or a health inspector who will want to see their paperwork. Their paperwork will not be in order. This will then produce a legal process, which will result in the shuttering of that organization. More NGOs and civil society organizations have been closed for health code violations than anything else in Russia. In a place like Venezuela, the regime uses the law, and the law is, laws are written very broadly and then used like a scalpel against the particular groups that the government deems a threat. So much so that, as one Venezuelan activist put it to me, he said, you know, the motto here should really be, for my friends, everything. 
for my enemies, the law. It goes on, it, in, in, in a sense, you know, in the world of media, a world that, that I work in, in all of these countries, the government controls most forms of media, online, television, radio, almost all, but not all. And what they don't control is important and meaningful. Why not have 100% control? Well, there are a lot of good reasons. One, governments need information too. And they need an alternative source of information than their own intelligence network, which is often flawed. If you look at a place like China, the Chinese Communist Party realizes that most members of the party are corrupt. What they need to know is who's egregiously corrupt. And that's why, to the degree that there's been any media freedom in China in the last decade, it's been in financial news. The party finds it very effective to have journalists looking into party members' behavior to find out who's really going beyond the pale. It's also useful as a, as, a, as, a, as a valve for allowing a little bit of pressure out of the system, allowing for the opposition to have some place where they can post their thoughts and ideas. One, because you want to know them. And two, it makes them less likely to do anything else. I've written a strongly, sternly worded article, and I feel like I've accomplished something, and now I can go back about my business, although maybe nothing changes. All of these regimes are fluent in the language of democracy and human rights. They host human rights conferences. They vie with each other to have membership in the Human Rights Council at the United Nations. They walk the halls of the United Nations. They're very much engaged in the wider world. They want to be connected to the wider world. They, they have fought hard to be members of the World Trade Organization and walk the halls of that organization. They, in much the same way that we've seen a growth in civil society and civil society groups putting pressure on these regimes from the outside, so it therefore follows that the modern dictator needs to have a civil society of their own. Now, most of you are probably familiar with the term NGO, non-governmental organization. Maybe you're familiar with the term gongos. What is a gongo? A gongo is a government-operated, non-governmental organization. Gongos are really effective because essentially it's the regime manufacturing its own civil society. And generally speaking, and you'll find these in country after country after country, generally you'll find these, these organizations with names that are, they sound wonderful. The Egyptian Organization for the Promotion of the Betterment of Women, and so on and so forth. And it sounds like an organization that couldn't possibly be up to anything but the the betterment of Egyptian society at writ large. In fact, what they are actually doing is several things. One, in the most practical sense, is they're soaking up foreign money. Or organizations, well-meaning organizations from abroad, f sending money to these organizations, thinking that they're human rights organizations, when in fact, they're simply making sure the actual genuine NGOs don't receive any funding, which they rarely do. Um, they're also there, in large part, for foreign media. They're there to run a counter-narrative for journalists who don't know better that, in fact, they're, they're talking to someone who's actually a front for the regime, far from being a critic. And the message that they deliver is a much more sophisticated one than what you would have heard in, the, in you know, 10, 15, 20 years ago. Their message will consistently be, you know, you raise a lot of good points about the human rights abuses in our country. We are on a road. It is an evolution. It is a process. I would be the first person to admit that we have problems here. But I seem to remember that it was a process in your own country, in the United States, correct? Okay, well hopefully with your help, we'll get there. It's a much more sophisticated message than simply saying, the things you say make you an enemy of the state. Of all the countries that I visited, the only place where that was still true was Venezuela, where I was regularly referred to as a member of the empire, which I'd never been referred to before. Um, and then, of course, maybe the most obvious and, 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 and elemental aspect of this is that all of these regimes hold elections. Now, you could say, well, yeah, I mean, that's not actually anything new. The Soviet Union held elections. Brezhnev would win with 99% of the vote. Well, that's the key difference, is that the modern dictator understands that the only elections worth stealing are those that appear to be contested. If, they're not, if, they, if they appear to be a sham election, then what did you gain by actually stealing it? So the modern dictator does not win elections with 99% of the vote. He wins with 70% of the vote. 70% is the new 99. <laughs> so 
The point being is that when you consider all of these things, what you find is that although we like to believe that authoritarian regimes, dictatorships, are dinosaurs, slow, lumbering behemoths, ossified Leninist bureaucracies, actually, in truth, they seldom are. They are be because had they continued to operate that way, they would have been am among the list of places that was no longer a dictatorship. Now, to be sure, there are a small handful of old school, retrograde dictatorships that have managed to limp uh, into the 21st century. They are the North Koreas uh, or the Turkmenistans of the world. Um, but they very much represent dictatorships past. For the Nigerian colonel who is looking at the political situation in his country and he's seeing an opportunity for himself to seize control and bring about a new Nigeria, he will not look at the example of North Korea and say, yes, that's my model. Rather, he'll look at any number of modern authoritarian regimes and see a pathway to model himself on. Because no one wants to be the next North Korea. The conditions really don't exist to recreate that for yourself, particularly if you don't have nuclear weapons. But this is really only half of the story because the other half of the story is that just as dictatorships have grown more nimble and sophisticated, so too have the people who are challenging them. And I feel like this is a particularly important aspect and something that we, 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 we often miss and something that I, I wanted to spend a lot of time with and address in my book. Um, because when we see people, and this is something we all have experience with now, particularly after the last several years, when we see people rise up and take to the streets, as we did, say, in January and February of 2011 in particular, in the cases of Tunisia and Egypt and so on, and Libya and so on, it seems as though it's a spontaneous act. That's the way it's presented to us. Images of tens of thousands of people pouring out of their homes and assembling in a square. It appears and is presented to us as if tens of thousands of people all woke up one day and had the same idea. Which if you begin to think about it, it's fairly ludicrous. I mean, people had been living under not just dictatorship, but Mubarak for 30 years. But on that day, was the day that they decided enough was enough? Collectively, and to move in a streamlined process all the way to Tahrir Square? No, it didn't happen that way. In fact, the truth of the matter is, is that successful revolutions are almost never spontaneous. As one activist put it to me, the only thing that spontaneity will do is that it will get you killed. It will do that if you act spontaneously. Because what we're not doing, the piece of the puzzle that we're missing, is all of the weeks and months, and in most cases, years, that lead up to that moment. Because it's during that period of time that there's not, there's not great work being going on that can be videotaped and broadcast on CNN, but rather it's very tedious work where activists in the trenches are learning valuable lessons about how to chip away at a regime's legitimacy, how to engage in effective propaganda, how to mobilize a movement, how to recruit, how to learn what they need to understand about the security services in that country. In, in country after country, that process is going on, and it's going on in fits and starts, and it usually appears to be abject failure. In the case of Egypt, there was very little appreciation of the fact that the people that were challenging the regime were learning anything at all. When in fact, and I spent a lot of time with, with the activists who were responsible for mobilizing people in Egypt before the revolution. I spent time with them before the revolution. And I spent time with them after. Uh, and their, their thinking and their planning was very detailed and specific. 
down to the level of particular activists who were going to work to bring people out into the streets on particular streets, on particular blocks, starting with, with, with alleyways that they knew were too narrow for any police or military vehicles to go down. And only when you got to the point where you had enough people out of their homes off of that one block that you could fill the alley, then you could only at that point then go to a larger street. And then at that point, only when you had a sufficient number predetermined could you then go from that larger street to, say, a main thoroughfare or a boulevard. It was a gradual process, and it was completely different from tactics that they'd used before, but it was something they had planned for for that day, for January 25th, when, when the protests really began. But the point being is that it took time. It took time when most people would have told you there was nothing at all going on in Egypt whatsoever. Um, and the other piece that we miss, which is even more true and dynamic and exciting today than maybe at any other time, is the way that these movements in different countries learn from each other. Even before the revolution in Egypt, the people I was meeting there were telling me about what they had just learned from the Green Movement in Iran in 2009. And I said, well, but you know, what did you learn from, from I mean, it, you know, you, you'd, you'd agree that it, was, that it failed. And I go, yes, you know, of course, yes, it failed. But of course it failed. I mean, we didn't expect it to succeed not right out of the gate, but let's look more granularly at what they've actually done. Let's look at the things that they did, the tactics that they use that we can import here. And in the course of my own travels, it was not uncommon at all for Venezuelans to ask me about Russians and Russians to ask me um, about uh, Egyptians or Malaysians to ask me about Chinese and who was learning what and who was doing, doing uh, the best work. And so for a, for a little over two years for my book, what I did was I set out to, to witness this struggle firsthand. Um, so I spent time um, reporting from China, Egypt, Russia, Venezuela, and Malaysia. And in each country, I set out to spend time with two groups of people. The people that served the regime, the people that perpetuated the political system, and the people who were trying to overthrow it. So on the one hand, that meant spending time with political advisors, uh, with technocrats, with uh, cronies, business cronies of the regime, with members of the military. And then on the other side of the equation, that meant students, academics, lawyers, environmentalists, bloggers, uh, a somewhat more ragtag group. And I have to say that what I found, and it was very surprising to me, is that over the course of these several years, I became more and more optimistic about those that were actually challenging the regimes. Because I was aware of this broader <coughs> spectrum of a decline in political freedom in the world, one year after another, I had started off with a much more pessimistic outlook than I actually ended up with. And the reason for that was that when you spend a great deal of time with, with these activists in these countries, um, you quickly realized that, well, the, I quickly realized these were not the people I expected to find. There were no romantics among them in any of these countries, in part because I don't think the romantics last very long. The people that I was meeting and spending time with were, uh, they were battle hardened, they were tacticians, they were strategists, and they came from all walks of life. In fact, indeed, one of their strengths is that you can never really guess where the next one will come from, where the next leader that will challenge the regime, whether it'll be like a woman that I met in Russia who whose activism began while she was on maternity leave with her second daughter and had no political history whatsoever, but within a matter of three years became one of the Kremlin's chief opponents. Or whether it be the student movement in Venezuela, which is absolutely incredible in its creativity um, in the way that it, it, it challenged, it's challenged the state there. Um, but you find that these people are creative and sharp and 
in each instance when I would leave a country, I was left with the feeling that I would not want to be that regime. Now, what this results in is, is a, many unexpected alliances and networks that are sprung up in different parts of the world. And I want to talk about one in particular um, by way of a closing. Um, I want to tell you a, a, a little bit about uh, someone named Serja Popovich. Now, Serja Popovich is Serbian, uh, and he was one of the student leaders of the nonviolent revolution in Serbia in 2000 that toppled Slobodan Milosevic. Well, in the immediate aftermath of Milosevic's fall, uh, Serja was, at that point, 27 years old uh, when he was leading the student movement. And he, like a number of the student leaders um, from that time, went into Serbian politics. And for him, it was a very brief period in Serbian politics because he quickly realized that this was not something that he was actually cut out for. This was not something that actually interested him. Perhaps after toppling a dictator, arguing over zoning regulations just didn't seem to, to you know, get the juices flowing anymore. Um, but I think that for a period of time, by his, own, by his own admission, he was somewhat disillusioned and wasn't really sure what it was he wanted to do next. But something started to happen, which was that again and again, he was being contacted by groups in other countries who were contacting him and saying, we know what you did, we're aware of your work, and we'd like you to come to talk to us about it. And so these invitations were coming from Ukraine and Georgia and more far-flung places. And it was a couple years later, while he was in South Africa, working with a group of, Zim of activists from Zimbabwe, that he had a bit of an epiphany. And he realized, you know, I don't know what I'm really trying to do here. This is what I know how to do. What I understand is how to topple dictators. And so he and another uh, veteran of the student movement in Serbia created an organization called Canvas, which is based in Belgrade. And it has, in the subsequent roughly nine years now, uh, trained nonviolent democratic movements in more than 50 countries. So what does that mean? Well, I very much wanted to know what that meant to, to do that type of work. And so um, I worked hard in trying to convince Serja to let me see Canvas do its work. And eventually, um, in 2011, uh, someone from his organization contacted me and said, could you be somewhere in several days at, to watch one of our trainings? And I said, absolutely, just tell me where. And they said, well, there are going to be a couple ground rules. The ground rules are first, you can never say where this meeting took place. Two, you can never say who we trained. And three, you can never identify any of our trainers. I accepted all these ground rules and several days later was on a Mediterranean island with activists from a Middle Eastern country being trained by Serbians. And what I witnessed there, and, and, and describe in my book, um, is, it was, it was an incredible thing, because it was watching a group of activists who had, had actually had some measure of success in their own country, but they had reached a plateau. And they felt as though that they weren't going to be able to get any further uh, without having the experience of, of being trained by someone who'd actually been successful all the way uh, uh, through uh, bringing down a regime. And what Canvas promises, and, and, and partially what they, what they insist on, is that one, they will never work with a group that has a history of violence, and two, they're not going to give you a blueprint for how to topple your government, because they're not Malaysian, they're not Iranian, they're not Venezuelan, they can't possibly know precisely the conditions in your country that exist that you'll need to exploit. But what they can do is teach you how to think about that strategically, to take those lessons and then to apply it in that context. They insist that these groups be, non, be nonviolent because it's not because they're pacifists necessarily at all, it's rather, it's a numbers game. And the numbers show that nonviolent revolu revolutions are far more likely to be successful than violent ones. That between 1900 and 2006, 25% of violent insurgencies were successful, but 
Slightly more than 50% of nonviolent revolutions were successful. So it's just purely pragmatism that leads them to this. And what I watched over a course of a week in a very dingy hotel was uh, activists um, bringing their, their most pressing questions, very con in some cases very concrete ones, and then also um, more macro strategic considerations of, of what it is they needed to, to succeed. Um, and so what they learned is they learned how to build support for their movement. That might be, mean beginning with basic intelligence gathering about how the government works. In the case of Serbia, they explained, one of the first things that we did is we had to understand how the secret police worked. And we realized we had a resource. And that resource was our grandparents. Many of our grandparents had worked for the secret police. They were members of the Communist Party, and they had retired. And like grandparents everywhere in the world, they enjoyed telling their stories. And so we would go and spend time with them and say, tell me exactly how it worked. And they were doing so in order to get an understanding of the procedures uh, that were in place. Another very important part of the intelligence gathering operation for a democratic movement was to figure out who are the people who are trusted in a community. In some places, it was the teachers. It was the teachers who had the greatest persuasive power in a population. In other parts, it was physicians and doctors. But they needed to understand who those people were in a community because they knew that if they could, if they could win the support of a certain key individuals, that would have a multiplying effect for their movement. At the end of the day, the way they view it is that it's a numbers game and that Ultimately, the regime cannot stand, no matter how powerful it may believe it, it is, if it doesn't have the support of the people. And so they, may own, they, they will be, at, at the outset, a minority movement. But it's also the case that the government's support is, is a minority of its own. And that what is ultimately it is about is it about winning people in the middle. And that if enough people are persuaded to join your side, that eventually the the very pillars of the regime begin to crumble. It, the regime, no regime, no government can function if people ref, just simply refuse to obey. And that was very much the case in Serbia when ultimately that Milosevic realized that he was up against the wall and when he ordered for the secret police to, to, to fire on the, on the people, they just put down their guns. They didn't want to. Why didn't they want to? Because as the Serbians had learned, it's very hard to fire on a crowd when you know your children are in that crowd. And so they would recruit the children of government officials to join their movement. It's very hard to fire on that crowd when, even if it's not a family member, you actually know the activists personally, person to person. Every time a member of the movement was arrested, they took it as an opportunity to get to know the police. It got to the point where Sergei had been arrested so many times that they would bring him back to the station and they'd just play chess. Because we don't really want to fill out the paperwork and you're back here again. It, they, made, they created a culture where among high school students, you were only cool if you'd been arrested. If you were a Serbian 18 year old in, in 1999, and you wanted to get a date, forget it if you haven't been arrested. So it became, it became attractive and appealing to become part of the movement. Again, all part of the numbers game that they needed to create. They learned basic things uh, in their training. They learned that the leaders of the movement never all met in one place. Um, they learned that, yes, you're being followed all the time, but when we actually look through our dossiers at the intelligence uh, service had created for each one of us. We, after the revolution, we poured over our files. We realized, yeah, my file was binder upon binder upon binder. All it did was list where I went, what I ate, what I drove, what I wore. There was never any analysis of what I was actually doing. So the minders really weren't doing much more than minding. So don't overestimate the fact that they're, that there's they're somehow some incredible brain trust that is anticipating your next move. It was actually a fairly mindless process. Um, they learned 
one of the most effective things was the use of humor and how to begin to chip away at a regime's legitimacy by simply poking fun at it. Because when you're poking fun at someone and all they're doing is getting angrier, it, at some point it begins to become ridiculous. So for one example that I, I liked from, from the case of Serbia was um, Milosevic's wife was known to uh, prefer a certain flower in her hair. Uh, I believe they were uh, uh, these uh, red flowers that she liked to wear in her hair. And so the students, they gathered uh, a bunch of turkeys and they attached red flowers to the turkeys' heads. Now apparently in Serbia, calling a woman a turkey is like one of the worst things you can possibly do. But they took these birds, and they took them down into, in, into the downtown area and they released them. Now by doing that, the turkey with a red flower on its head walking down the street is inherently a political act. No Serbian sees that turkey and doesn't know who you're talking about. Yeah. <laughs> and so when that happens, what do the police have to do? The police have to be dispatched to catch turkeys. Well, how, does you, how do you think that makes police officers feel when they're chasing birds down the street through traffic? On the one hand, they've got to do it. Because if they don't do it, they'll get in trouble. But on the other hand, they're catching birds. And when they did catch the birds, they took them back to the police station. The students then released a press, uh, a, a press release saying that they were concerned about the human rights abuses that were being committed against the turkeys and that they wanted to see the turkeys and the turkeys had to be released. They made a mockery of the whole process. And the police understood they were the butt of the joke. You can't only do that so many times and then expect that the police are going to continue to become a, be obedient when the regime calls on them. Um, and there was example, example after that. Um, now, and then of course there's the, there's, there is the not so funny examples. And these came up too, where the activists from this country said, yes, okay, I understand. And that's very interesting. Um, but, you know, in our country, we have police officers who are particularly brutal. And it's as if they joined the police force because they wanted to uh, engage in acts of violence. They enjoy coming out for a crackdown and beating young people in the street. What do we do then? I mean, you know, Turkey's not going to save you then. Um, and the Serbs said, yeah, no, you're right. You're right about that. But we had those too. Um, and what we did in that instance was when that police officer was beating a 15-year-old in the street, senseless. We took a photograph. And then we took that photograph and we made a poster. And on the poster, it had an image of that officer with his club beating this person on the street. And underneath the image, we put his name. And under that, we put his cell phone number. And under that, we, we wrote, please call X and ask him, why does he beat our children? And then we took those posters and we plastered them everywhere his wife likes to shop. And we took those posters and we plastered them on the route that he walked his son to school. And we took those posters and we took them back to the village where his mother still lives and we plastered the village with those posters. The point is, we, you're right, we're never going to sit down and have a heart-to-heart -heart with that officer. We're never going to be able to persuade him to put down the baton. But maybe we don't have to. Maybe we can reach him through his family or through his community. The point is that we can get to him. And we can do it if we're creative and if we're smarter than the other side. And it's for that reason and for acts like that that I left thinking that Although it's hard to be a dictator today, it's only getting harder. Thank you very much. So we have time for, for questions. And I was asked to remind everyone to use the microphones. I'm happy to take the conversation in any direction that you'd like to take it. Thank you for a great talk. Is this on? Yeah. I'll Thank set. you for a great talk uh, in some of the different subjects you touched on. 
I'm curious about the recent re reaction by the North Koreans to the kind of scathing report on their human rights and how they've literally sent envoys to Europe and around Asia to try to get support in case this is presented uh, to the UN. Mm -hmm. And you're surprised because you would think that the North Korean regime doesn't care particularly about having its human rights record blasted in these bodies? Well, yes, and given that they, they almost take pride in being the closed society and the insular society that they are. Right, right. Well, I, you know, I would say that, in fact, that's not atypical behavior. Um, you'll find that, I think, in example after example, and I, I, I'd agree with you that at its root, it is perhaps most stark and surprising in the case of North Korea, given how egregious the crimes of that state are against its people. Um, but in, it, is, it is a universal fact that, that even dictators care what we think about them. Um, you know, it is something that you hear time and time again, not necessarily just from these recent areas of struggle, but from people who uh, persevered and survived through um, the communist bloc of the Cold War who would say and have said repeatedly that in fact the criticism of that government when they were being imprisoned was incredibly important to the way they were being treated. Um, it was incredibly important for uh, not just their morale but putting the government on edge. So for example um, there was a period in time in the 1980s where um, wherever Gorbachev went, he would always be, uh, every meeting would begin with this head of state or that head of state saying, well, I want to begin by asking you about these, these, these several individuals, these several dissidents. And Gorbachev said after um, the Soviet Union collapsed that it really got to him. He was tired of hearing about these same names being pounded. Why can't we talk about things that I've come here to talk to you about? when we got to talk about these three or four or five people every time. It, get, it got to a point where he finally was like, we just need to get these people out of the, out of the equation because they're holding up other important business that we need to do. Um, it's meaningful, it was meaningful to me, in the course of, of, of writing this book, I, I interviewed more, uh, more than 200 people um, in these different countries. And it's, it was a telling fact to me that um, no activist in any of these countries I ever met ever asked to be anonymous. And the reason was, despite the incredible risks that they're taking every day and the work that they do living where they live, to a man and woman, they felt that they, it was most dangerous for them when they weren't known, if they lived in the shadows. But in fact, to the degree that the world, world knew their names, it gave them some small measure of protection. And on the other end of the spectrum, the only people that ever asked to speak off the record were people who worked in the government, which should tell you something. Other questions? At the start, at the start of your talk, you, re you referenced Egypt and the mm -hmm. fact that although they knew things were getting more difficult, they had no clue as to what was really coming to get them. I'm wondering, fast forward now, we ran through the Muslim Brotherhood, which democratically elected probably would have turned into another dictatorship ultimately and they're taken out by al-sisi in the army once so we've got the army in charge again do you think they've learned anything and do you think they'll be more difficult to turn over ultimately will uh sisi's government be more difficult to topple than yeah. yes i think so um well i think that um you know it's it's it was, it was a concern for me at the time, even going back to Mubarak's fall, because uh, up until, in it's sort of important or useful context, um, for the previous, say, eight years or so, the, the conversation in Egypt at, any, at every time that I visited was always this, Mubarak is getting old, who's going to be next? What's, what, who's going to, to, uh, to follow him? And the question was always, well, it's either going to be his son, or it's going to be someone from the military. And all of Egypt's modern day presidents have been military men. And so that was the logic there, except in the case of Mubarak, he had 
been clearly been grooming his son to take over, um, but he'd never made a definitive statement. And so everyone was sort of in suspended animation as to what was going to happen. My concern was that when the revolution did occur, um, the military took control of the situation. People rallied behind the military because something that's really important to recognize is that the military is the only institution in Egypt that actually truly functioned. It was the only thing that actually worked. And so there is a baseline a level of respect uh, in, in, in the supposed integrity of the military that helped it consolidate that moment and, 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 and to say, look, we will be the stewards of the revolution from this point on. We thank the people for the role that they played. Now it is our job to steer this process forward so that we can realize uh, our, this democratic opportunity. Or was it actually just settling that question that people have been asking all along, who's next, Gamal Mubarak or the military? So was it a revolution or was it actually just succession? Succession assisted by a public up uprising. I think it was the latter. Um, I think that that's how it's been played. It may, perhaps it wasn't necessarily had to be the case. I believe that the Muslim Brotherhood actually had an opportunity. Um, most members of the Muslim Brotherhood should, be, should recall, Morsi was not their first choice. That was not the person they wanted to have, and, and many of them knew his faults. And, and many of them, uh, members of the Muslim Brotherhood, blame him for abusing that opportunity by, through his brashness and through his own authoritarian turn. Um, but now what we have in Sisi is we have um, someone who has um, no qualms uh, crushing um, those who speak out against him with a level of repression in Egypt is worse today than it was under Mubarak. And then there's another dynamic, which is that the opinion of the United States counts for very little uh, to this new regime. And that's in part because it's being bankrolled by governments in the Gulf. So the leverage, to the degree that it was ever leveraged, that the United States had in its own economic aid to Egypt now is literally 10% of what the government can receive from Gulf monarchies. So as a result, CC doesn't really have to listen to Washington and probably prefers not to because he doesn't like what he hears. Yeah. And uh, from the sound of things, it's going to take a while for the opposition to get, get, behind, get on their game to, get to, to challenge him. Yes, I mean, you know, there's, there's really no political opposition, per se. I mean, even in Egypt, I mean, that was one of the things that was so um, stark about what happened in 2011 is that you didn't, this wasn't a movement that was organized by the political opposition. I mean, I spent, I was in Egypt in 2006, spending time with a member of the political opposition. Um, and in 2006, I remember this gentleman, a leader of this opposition political party, bragging to me about the fact that his security detail was provided by Mubarak. Does that sound like a member of someone who's trying to actually challenge the government? So, um, so you know, they were in fact part of the manufactured facade of of a democratic Egypt that Mubarak was engaged in creating. So even the actual opposition parties were actually just appendages of the state itself. That's why the only people in Egypt up in 2010 and 2011 who were taking chances or who were actually risking something to challenge the government were all young people, and that's where the change came from. I see, and. Uh it sounds like the, the, the young people will probably be that again, but it's going to take a while. Yeah, and the young people who are leaders of that revolution are all in prison now. Another question. Yes. Yeah, I wanted to ask you uh, if you could uh, tell us a little more about the organization Canvas. Uh, it sounded as though it was uh, founded by a bunch of uh, um, young uh, spontaneous, uh, rev, you know, revolutionaries, uh, and then it uh, su suddenly they formed this organization, which is uh, uh, advising other countries worldwide. And my curiosity, particularly, is about where they get their money from, right. um, because you brought up the uh, the idea of the Gongo, the government operator, or as I understood it, originally a government organized, uh, non governmental organization, um, and. You know, in looking at them, I often have a hard time figuring out. Um, I, I, I find that looking at the funding sources for them tells you a lot about, you know, what the organization really is about. Right. Thank you. Right. In the case of their work, 
Um, you're talking about an organization that doesn't really require much funding, in fact. Um, that's very lean. You're, it's, a, it's a staff of only a handful of people working out of an office in Belgrade. Um, and the training sessions uh, are paid for by any number. Each training session has a different funder um, who wants to bring these activists together with these trainers um, to have that experience. Um, so there it isn't a single funder. In the case of Canvas in particular, though, um, they also have an additional benefit of some sort, which is that one of the, Sergej Popovich is, the, is one of the co-founders. His partner, who was you know, the same age, 20-something in 2000, uh, was, didn't go to work for the government. He went to work in telecommunications and now runs a telecommunications company in Belgrade as, as a Serbian citizen. And so he actually pays for a great deal of their expenses himself. So it's, the, it's the, this corporation that is you know, uh, someone who was responsible for bringing Milosevic down who helps to underwrite their work. Any other questions? We're coming up on time, but we have a couple minutes left. How do you analyze the survival strategy of the Assad government? And uh, if you'd also talk about it, uh, in survival strategy of the uh, government in North Korea. Well, in the case of North Korea, their strategy is in some sense simpler, which is that they've effectively just fallen back into a defensive crouch against the rest of the world. And they're able to do that in part because of two qualities, if you could put it that way. One is that they have no compunction about killing a large percentage of their own population. So if you are capable of that, that can be uh, helpful in creating a police state. And then secondly, they are able to do that without facing consequences because of their nuclear weapons program. So a combination of a willingness to decimate their population and to have that security um, from nuclear weapons allows them to run a state that is effectively an anomaly in our world today. In the case of Assad, that is not how Assad wanted to wanted, wanted events to play out. It began as a nonviolent revolution in Syria in March of 2011. Assad responded immediately with violence because he looked at the examples in Tunisia and Egypt and his analysis was that if those governments had responded with the violence sooner, they would have survived. And so he, 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 he did respond that way. The fact that it resulted in civil war makes Syria a, a model for what not to do for other regimes in the world. No one wants to be Assad either, because under any cir circumstance, he's at best, if he survives, is going to be able to run a rump form of a previous state. He will, Syria will never be accepted back into the international system. And to go back to the, my, my, my point at the outset, this is another way in which the world has changed. Because in 1981, Assad's father faced an uprising of his own in the city of Hama. And in the city of Hama, they rose up against the regime, and in the, in the space of a month, Assad's father, Hafez Assad, killed, we estimate, as a low figure, 25,000 people in a month. We have no images of what happened in Hama. We don't actually know if the number is 25,000 or 40,000. But I can tell you that if that happened in Syria in 1981, where was Syria in 1982, 83, 84, 85? It was again among the family of nations. It was still a legitimate state. That won't be true for Bashar Assad no matter what. And that's a yet another way in which the world has changed and become much more difficult for dictators to operate in. I think we're out of time. Thank you very much.
that was Will Dobson discussing dictatorships and democracy in this Juno World Affairs Council presentation produced in collaboration with 360 North. It was recorded November 12, 2014 at 360 in Juneau. With support from GCI, Alaska Electric Light and Power Company, Wastman and Associates Incorporated, Core Alaska Incorporated, Hecla Greens Creek Mining Company, Sealaska, Alaska Power and Telephone, 